Welcome to uh, June the 30th, uh, the day before Canada Day Media Advisory today. Uh, glad you're all with us today and thank you for uh, your, your kind wishes and well wishes over the last few days as uh, we were able to get a negative test result for myself and certainly an anxious moment for a lot of folks, uh, including my family and others. But uh, it's all turned out uh, for the better. And uh, we thank you for, uh, for all the good wishes out there. Thank you so much. Also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Ward 6 Councillor Tom Jackson, who filled in for me at last uh, Friday's media availability. Thank you, Tom. And uh, happy to be back at it and here with all of you today. So this is a good opportunity you know, to remind everyone that some, is, that some of the essential public health guidelines are still, when you're out in public, stay two meters apart from other people. If you keep your distance, wear, if you can't keep your distance, wear a mask, wash your hands often with soap and water, if pre preferably, and uh, alcohol-based hand sanitizers if, uh, if that's not available. Avoid touching your eyes and mouth and noise and uh, limit contact with people who are in higher risk, specifically uh, older adults and those in poor health. And if you have symptoms, COVID-19 symptoms, book an appointment to get tested, you can do this through your doctor or by calling Hamilton Public Health Services at 905-974-9848. Uh, together, we will continue to contain the spread of this COVID-19 in our community. I, I must say that uh, since I went to, to get the test on Friday, it was uh, you know, quick and easy and speedy up at the uh, Hester Street drive through Center. The people were fantastic. The, uh, the swab up the nose is not, uh, not such a big deal. Um, Feels a little odd, but certainly not nothing uh, nothing life threatening there. But uh, the results came in rather quickly, so Monday afternoon, and uh, very much appreciate the speed and efficiency of that uh, process. So uh, you can rest well assured that uh, if you uh, are getting tested and you're feeling like you have symptoms, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we've been saying all along: if you feel sick, stay home, and if you have symptoms, get tested. And certainly uh, something I needed to do for the benefit of all and you need to do as well should you uh, have the similar circumstance. So please do. Some announcements on the federal side. Um, applications are open for expanded Canadian emergency business accounts, CBA, now available through uh, Canada's largest bank. So the eligibility was broadened last month to include sole proprietors, farmers, businesses who use contractors or pay themselves through dividends. The, uh, Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program will be extended by one month. The, this program allows small businesses across the country to pay less in rent. And this uh, emergency uh, rent assistance for small business provides relief for small businesses experiencing financial hardships due to COVID-19. It offers unsecured forgivable loans as well to eligible commercial property owners. So uh, all of that to uh, help reduce the rent owed by their impacted small business tenants. Uh, also allows uh, you know folks to meet their operating expenses on commercial properties and you know the bills don't go away they keep coming and so uh, that level of assistance assistance to property owners was uh, initially required to offer a minimum of 75 percent rent reduction for the months of april may and june 2020 this is now extended until july which is good news for all of those on the property and tenancy on the provincial side, the province announced today that tomorrow all provincial parks will be open to the public free of charge. So visit uh, www.ontarioparks.com or social media updates on the status of your local provincial park and what services and amenities are available to patrons uh, at this time. So remember that safety precautions will be enforced, including park capacity, physical distancing. So make sure to get there early if you plan to, uh, to go out and attend. And moreover, the province announced today that residents of all ages can enjoy fishing in Ontario without having to purchase a license or carry an outdoor card for the first two weeks of July, from July the 4th through to July the 19th. As well, uh, in this, on the city side, uh, back in uh, May the 13th, the Hamilton City Council invoked a temporary fireworks ban. The ban is to prevent large gatherings and spread the COVID-19 to reduce the potential for fires at a time when emergency response teams are required to handle issues directly related to COVID-19 emergencies and to protect emergency response and municipal law enforcement staff from having to inspect more businesses or respond to more situations rather than the necessary uh, pandemic issues. So as a reminder, the sale and discharge of all fireworks in the city of Hamilton is prohibited until July the 4th, 2020. And the temporary ban includes the use of sparklers, 
which the government of Canada classifies as consumer fireworks. Uh, residents found to be acting not in accordance with the temporary ban will be subject to a penalty of $500. The penalties apply to residents, businesses, and not residents alike. Masks on transit. As you know, on uh, June the 22nd, it became mandatory to wear a non-medical mask on public transit in Hamilton. We're seeing about a 75% uh, uptake from the customers uh, wearing non-medical masks right now, but we know we can do better. So as we prepare to return to resume collecting fares and having our customers load the bus from the front door, we will be distributing non-medical masks to customers who need them. Paul Johnson will have more details and we'll talk about how customers can get those masks in a few minutes. Please, if you're going to be riding the HSR or darts and you are able, please wear a mask. We know this is an extra step that can help protect others in spaces where physical distancing can be hard to maintain. Hamilton bike share announcement today. Uh, update, starting today, you will start to see the fleet of iconic blue bikes around our city once again in operation. Thanks to the local not-for-profit Hamilton Bike Share Inc. for relaunching the bike share system for Hamilton riders. The system will continue to span from Ottawa Street to Dundas with over 800 bikes and 130 hubs. Bikes are available to rent 24 seven. So if you're new to bike share and want to sign up or if you had a membership in the past and want to resubscribe, you can visit www.hamiltonbikeshare.ca or use the social bicycle app. There are different membership plans in place, including an, an Everyone Rides initiative for individuals who may experience barriers for accessing the system. And to help reduce the spread of COVID-19, Hamilton Bike Share is taking extra precautions, including regular sanitizing touch services when bikes are serviced and encouraging riders to follow public health guidelines frequent hand washing and physical distancing while they're using the SOTI bike. And for more information to get rolling, again, www.hamiltonbikeshare.ca. Filming resumes in Hamilton. Filming can resume at, a, at certain locations in the city the week of July the 6th, which will help support economic recovery in the community. And of note, in 2019, production spent approximately $60 million in Hamilton on local products and services and hotel stays. The revised safety guidelines for film and television industry in Ontario, as well as best practices for the industry in response to COVID-19 have been approved and posted by the Ministry of Labour, Training, Skills and Development. Production will be required to follow the guidelines and have a site-specific health and safety plan in place of each film location. And film companies can reach out to the city's film office staff for more information. So again, filming can start on July the 6th, this coming Monday. Pay by phone, mobile parking app <clears throat> has been long in the works and uh, by, by council direction, it's uh, now going to be in place with this in the city's business improvement areas. Hamilton Municipal Parking System staff have been preparing to implement a mobile payment option for parking referred to as pay by phone. So city staff are planning to launch the mobile parking application on Monday, July the 6th. The app is inclusive of all on-street parking meters and municipal, municipal car parks and is a nice, easy way to pay for parking just using your phone. No more nickels and quarters or dimes or cards. Uh, just use your phone and uh, you can uh, make your payment there by Payment by coin at meters and coin credit cards and off-street lots will still be available, however. And so if you're determined to use a coin-operated uh, system, that you can still go to those locations. Uh, more information will be shared on that uh, later this week. So Paul, please share with us some, uh, some news from the EOC perspective. Paul Johnson. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And it is, uh, it is great to have you back sitting with us virtually and uh, I'm glad the process, uh, you got to experience the process, I guess. I'm not glad you had to go through the process, but it is something for you to be able to say actually from personal experience what it's like. And I know that that's gonna be helpful for people who are thinking about whether they should go through the process. So that's great. I'm wearing my Canada shirt today, getting all ready for uh, the 1st of July, which is tomorrow. And the 1st of July also marks the day that we're going to start collecting fares uh, on our transit system. And as the mayor mentioned, uh, as beginning Monday, we will start distributing masks in a, in a few ways. Uh, one of the ways that people can pick up free masks uh, while the quantity lasts is at the Hunter Street GO station. Uh, the Hunter Street GO station HSR window is actually open now for, for business and people can come there also to renew uh, passes, reload their Presto cards and the like, but we'll also have some free masks available 
uh, there. We're also working with DARTS and we're working with a number of social service organizations across the city to distribute masks uh, to individuals who access those programs uh, in order to get masks in the hands of those who need it most. I do know a number of people have asked why uh, we just don't have our drivers uh, handing out masks. And of course, we've made some physical changes to our buses uh, to in install um, what we call the bio shields, but the plexiglass shields that are there for our drivers. And it just wouldn't be practical for our drivers to be handing out masks to those who, who don't have them uh, on the buses themselves. So uh, we're having them through these locations, but uh, really encouraging people to go out and get their masks uh, uh, and, and make sure that they continue to use them as the mayor mentioned. Uh, and we've mentioned last week, a uh, pretty good start to it overall, but uh, we need to do better. Uh, we need to get up much higher than the mid 70% range overall that we're there. And I, I have heard, uh, uh, thanks to all of those who have left me voicemails on my uh, office phone in the city of Hamilton, uh, indicating that some of the routes that they travel, uh, it's much less than 75%. And uh, it's important for us to continue to understand where there are areas where we need to do uh, better, but we're really encouraging our transit users uh, to do so. So uh, two big changes coming up as we enter into July. The first going back to front door boarding and uh, fare collection in our transit system, which is uh, a helpful sign for the sustainability of our transit system moving forward. And then starting Monday, we will have some availability uh, through social organizations, through darts and through our Hunter Street GO Station HSR window uh, for people to pick up free masks. Uh, I will tell you though, they are single use masks. So this is meant for folks who, who are perhaps uh, still waiting to get a hold of one or trying to get a hold of one, um, but they'll be there for you if you don't have a mask or forgot a mask and do wish to take transit in our city. Uh, I wanna say a word of, of thanks to our paramedics for their thanks to the community. Uh, our paramedic service uh, produced a video, uh, all done in house. Uh, so we didn't use uh, uh, resources to produce this. It was done by, by our own communication staff, uh, but our paramedics and our frontline paramedics in particular really wanted to thank the community for the support that they've seen uh, throughout the, uh, the, the phase up till now of this pandemic. And we know that things haven't stopped and we know our paramedics are still obviously having to wear lots more PPE than they normally do in terms of their perfect protective equipment. They're still dealing with lots of, of uh, COVID possible calls, but uh, really the, the crisis portion of this in those early days where we were uh, working very hard to keep the community uh, safe and continue to deliver those services, it was really appreciated by our paramedics, how many people stepped up and, and uh, brought PPE to our paramedic service, brought meals and other things to our paramedics, and just wanted to thank them as part of a whole team of of either emergency services or essential services that have been working, um, uh, you know, with a little bit of a different amount of uh, protective equipment on, but uh, in the same way uh, that they always have been protecting the community. So that is up on the city's YouTube channel. Uh, it's being circulated. It's just a way of one part of our organization thanking the community uh, for their support. You will recall a couple of weeks ago, we started to talk about some of the rec things that will happen this summer that are different because uh, we're not having some of the same recreation programming in our parks. Our SUPI program is not operating as it normally would in 2020, but uh, we do have rec at the park occurring in, uh, and this is a, an opportunity for people to uh, be in, uh, in our parks and also to have some kits that families can take home with all sorts of great activities that have been brought together and developed by our great uh, recreation staff uh, here in Hamilton. So we're um, uh, visiting 27 parks a week through the summer, uh, the week of the civic holiday in August. Uh, we're not going to be doing that, but uh, we're going to be visiting parks for many of the other weeks through the summer. And if you go on to the city's website, uh, the one-stop shop for all things recreation, and it's, it's a really important place to go because things in recreation are happening uh, fairly quickly and the changes are occurring each week. So it's a great place to go, hamilton.ca backslash recreation. You can also see the stuff that's uh, there about rec at the park, but I'd really encourage families who are looking for increased activities that they can do with their, with their kids uh, on their own to pick up these kits, uh, but also to experience some of the park activities that we will have at select parks over the course of the summer. Splash pads are open. And the other piece that's happening in recreation, of course, is that beginning next week and the week after, we will begin to open uh, some of the 14 pools, indoor and outdoor, that will be open in the city of Hamilton throughout the summer. Uh, we did announce it as the week of, so not all of the, the ones that were scheduled for the week of the 6th will open on the 6th. They will open through the week, and the same with the week of the 13th. Uh, we're 
thinking we're pretty close to hitting the mark in terms of all the pools we expected in those weeks to be open within those weeks. But uh, if we run into any uh, challenges, some of them make it bumped out a little bit further. But uh, congratulations to all of our rec staff and in particular our, our lifeguards and, and the team that will be uh, keeping people safe at the pool. They've had to go through a tremendous amount of training to be ready, uh, not only to do their life saving, which uh, on occasion we're required to do uh, within our pools, but uh, also the general activities in order to keep people safe, but also make sure we get as many people participating and having a chance to uh, to swim as, as possible. We know that uh, we are not opening all the pools this summer, and uh, that's a, a source of, of disappointment to the community, but uh, we, just, we just don't have the ability to do that in 2020, but we're pleased to be offering what we are offering. And, and again, I want to thank our recreation staff uh, for doing that as well. Uh, so it's it's continuing to be the mantra of how do we restart services well we are starting to look at our facilities and uh, the EOC has approved uh, purchases in the last couple of weeks of all of the things that we need for our facilities when they do reopen and as you heard uh, today uh, from the provincial announcements very much talk of, of using this next week or so to analyze the data around cases and to see when the province might uh, be ready to to move into their stage three and for us to look at uh, further openings of, of services and activities. Uh, one thing that did come up, uh, which I think I'll remind people of as we head into a holiday Wednesday tomorrow, is that uh, the, the playground structures within parks remain closed. In most cases, the yellow tape, caution tape, is either blown down, been taken down, and all the rest. There are signs on all of our play structures uh, that do have, uh, warn the public that they are closed. Uh, they are still subject to the provincial orders, and therefore, if, if people are willfully you know, ignoring those signs and using them, uh, you can actually be fined for that. Uh, but the reason it's closed is that we're, they're still annual analyzing, and I know Dr. Richardson and her team are, and they're certainly doing it provincially, we heard from the minister today. They're still, still analyzing, you know, what is a safe use and how can we safely use playground equipment? And I know for lots of people, they, they say, why can't we get that playground equipment up and going? My kids would like to swing, go down the slides and all the rest. And uh, just a reminder, they are still closed, and it is uh, because of the evaluation that's still going on by health representatives about how they can be safely open. So as I've been saying a lot for the last few weeks, please go out and enjoy what is available to you. Uh, let's not worry so much about the few things that aren't, but let's uh, talk about the things that are available. Uh, enjoy Canada Day if you're able to. And, and also I wanna pass on a word of, of thanks to all of those who will be working on Canada Day in our services that are 24-7 uh, operations and uh, thank them for uh, being at service uh, when, when some of us will be taking just a little bit of a breather to celebrate Canada Day. Dr. Richardson. Thank you, Paul. Just uh, Mr. Mayor, very good to see you back and uh, great to be back as well. And I'll just join Paul now at the, at the front end of this, thanking all the people who are going to be working this Canada Day. We do have a, a crew of public health staff that will be continuing to work to support our community's response to COVID-19. And so many, many thanks to all of them that will be working over this holiday day and as well over many that have uh, come and gone over the course of our response to COVID-19. Uh, so in terms of cases today, we're at 842 as of nine o'clock this morning. That's up by nine from yesterday. 834 that are lab confirmed and eight that are probable. Of the total 842, 737 or 87 and a half percent are resolved, which is very good news. Um, our deaths remain stable at 44 to date, and we have no institutional outbreaks, no community outbreaks. And so we're still holding very strong in terms of that piece. Um, and of course, there's more details on all of that on our website. Just again with the holiday tomorrow, a reminder that the drive-through COVID testing center at Dave Anderchuk Mountain Arena is closed for the Canada Day holiday. The other two centers do remain open. Um, and so people can uh, go there. I just want to uh, say a few more words about testing because we do appreciate that with the requirements for testing for visiting long-term care homes and retirement homes, as well as the need for pre-surgery testing for surgery in the community, there's been a tremendous increase in demand for testing. Um, and we very much appreciate that people need their test results back in a timely way. We are, uh, we do have the staff on hand in public health who are doing the bookings right now, uh, along with family doctors, and they're trying very hard to get people booked into the available times. Our assessment centers were originally designed to do 200 tests a day, and we're able to double that up to 400 tests a day over the last month. 
um, and even exceeded that some days, um, getting up to 700, but it's really not designed to do that at all. And um, it does from the standpoint of protecting the health and safety of our healthcare workers who are working these sites, it is really important that we you know, manage the volumes and make sure that they stay safe as well as all those that are attending at the center. Uh, they're very much a cooperative effort of hospitals, primary care, and ourselves, and um, they were brought together with resources that were available when services were down due to the COVID-19, and then as services have reopened in primary care hospitals and ourselves, there's um, a real uh, challenge in terms of continuing to resource these and not to have resources there to expand them any further. So we do have tremendous empathy for those who are calling to get booked in and to get their test results, but we at this point aren't able to increase capacity further. We're working with the partners and Ontario Health West to look at what we might be able to do. Um, or maybe there's some policy shifts that need to be made in terms of the frequency that, that uh, testing is required in long-term care homes. We know that's uh, being discussed as well. Um, and in in terms of the results themselves, we know just how important it is to get those so you can see your loved one or um, manage to get back to work or whatever it may be. We don't have any control over the process for test results to come from the lab back to the individual. So it's very important that people do check the provincial online portal to see if your results are there. I'm pleased to say that for those who are positive, about 60, 61% of those are turned around within a day or two. And so they're very quick to come back. The frustrating part is for those who are negative, because we do know that sometimes those results are taking up to 10 days to come through. Um, we don't have any different access to those than uh, you might have, no sooner access to those pieces. So the best thing to do is to continue to check the portal if you're looking for a result and uh, call your family doctor if, um, if you're still concerned because you haven't seen a result. Um, for us, we will contact you around your results only if you're positive. And so that's our role in terms of doing that follow-up. So we do very much appreciate it. It's a frustrating time right now, just as we all try to figure out how to make this all work in, the, uh, in a world where we live with COVID, but um, we don't have uh, any special access to those results, I'm sorry to say. So that's about it for me for today. I think, Mr. Mayor, I'll just uh, send it back on over to you. Hey, thank you. And uh, you know, I can certainly attest to the fact that uh, the moment you get in, go in for a test and are waiting for res results, uh, that puts a hold on a whole lot of other people that you may have had contact with. So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of pins and needles uh, as a result of that. So getting timely test results back, I think, is, uh, is important for both positive and negative. And I know that they're uh, doing the best they can, but the labs are working probably triple time to uh, to try and make that uh, work but uh, i do appreciate the uh, the efficiency of uh, having the test done and the good work that our, all of our public health officials are doing out there so stressful times for them for sure and uh, I'm, I sh I'm sure they know that uh, timeliness is important before we go to um, media questions let me just uh, shout out to the bayliner condos on francis avenue in stony creek these residents teamed up to raise $450 in cash and enough perishable food donations to fill two vehicles, all in support of the Stony Creek Community Food Bank. So this is the second time they've donated cash and food items to the food bank. So congratulations and thanks goes out to uh, Ann Elliott and the entire team at the residents of the Bayliner Condos on Francis Avenue. Thank you, well done. And to the Tire Cat Football Club and Forge FC, these two teams teamed up and raised over $30,000 through their Hamilton Proud mask campaign. The team produced Hamilton Proud face masks, which went out free of charge to every season ticket holder, but were also available for sale for $19.99 for a two pack of masks. So the proceeds of that $30,000 are going to food for kids right here in Hamilton with schools uh, closed during the pandemic. Food for Kids is sending each child in its program a $25 grocery card every two weeks. Now, the program costs uh, exceed $62,000 per month and the organization relies on the generosity of community do donations and online fundraising to sustain supporting these kids. So the donation from the Hamilton Tiger Cats and Football Club and Forge FC has had a huge impact on uh, their ability to provide all of these food vouchers. So thank you to the football clubs 
and thank you and congratulations to Food for Kids and all the kids out there that are uh, getting help and assistance. And if you want to donate, uh, you can go to uh, www.canadahelps.org. And um, if you're a season's ticket holder and have not yet received your free masks, don't worry, they're on their way. And uh, as you know, wearing non-medical masks like the Hamilton Proud Trace mask is always a good idea when physical distancing is not possible. Uh, thanks to Matt Afanek, the pres president, CEO, chief operating officer of the Tiger Cats and Forge FC and all the staff and the players. Uh, they're doing a wonderful community service and uh, they are great community partners. Thank you and well done. And thank you again to all of our frontline and essential workers, our nurses, nursing home staff, the cleaners out there keeping all of the uh, carts and uh, surfaces clean uh, in, our, in our locations, uh, in our stores, in our long-term care facilities, grocery store workers, truckers, everyone is going up above and beyond during the pandemic. And, you know, those that are not taking a holiday tomorrow and uh, continuing to work to keep our city functional, hats off to you. Thank you so much for your ongoing efforts. We appreciate them and we appreciate everything you do, in fact. Thank you all for that. And I'll go to Jasmine now to uh, take some questions from the media. Jasmine. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we have six media on the phone today. We'll start with one question and one follow-up for each of you. Uh, first question goes to Samantha Craigs from CBC Hamilton. Samantha, you can go ahead. Um, hi there. Thanks for taking my call, my questions. Um, my first question is for Dr. Richardson. I've been talking to um, some uh, doctors at HamSmart who are doing testing of migrant workers. And uh, as we've seen in surrounding areas, that's been a population that has... Um, it has the potential to uh, be impacted a lot. Um, can, can you elaborate for me what your concerns are around that area of migrant workers? In terms of temporary farm workers, Sam, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, an, had, it's been a very challenging issue for many parts of the province where they have larger numbers of migrant farm workers. We're lucky here in Hamilton in that um, our particular group is small. And right now we only have, I think it's about 450 temporary farm workers who are on site at this point in time. We tend to get more of the temporary farm workers later on in the season. And so we you know, have been working with the farms. We've been inspecting them as we're required to do in any case. Um, but working with them around IPAC and those issues, we've been fortunate to have the Ham Smart Docs um, stepping up and uh, looking to work with the farms as well and look at testing and those sorts of issues. Um, we're very much though looking to the experiences in Erie St. Clair, in um, Haldeman Norfolk, in Niagara, and trying to understand and learn from them what have been the key issues. We know that in the, these types of housing, it's quite close together, that it's very difficult to maintain um, physical distancing in those settings. We know that there are different ideas about testing and healthcare and working when sick and all those sorts of things. And so we're very much trying to understand the patterns of what has happened in the other areas where they've been harder hit and um, what it is that we need to do, to continue to do uh, to make sure that we reduce any risk here. So we are um, talking further with them. We're looking at those things. We're continuing to inspect them. We're continuing to work with them around, making sure that they have the resources they need, uh, make sure that uh, nobody is experiencing illness and, and look at testing through HamSmart. So we'll continue to work on those issues. And um, you know, it's just our, our best wishes go out to all of the workers and the challenges that they're having. Um, in Erie St. Clair and Haldeman, Norfolk and Niagara. Uh, and just, um, you know, we're, we're doing our best to support them as we can. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Mayor, I know you've been asked a lot if there are any plans to make mask wearing mandatory indoors. Um, can you just elaborate for me once again, what your position is on that? Um, I, I would support, uh, you know, having masks indoors, I think gives people a, a you know, greater comfort level and it helps businesses with the ambiguity around who should and who should not be wearing a mask. And we know that masks are, are effective. And so I'm, uh, I'm working with the uh, public health and I'll, maybe I'll let uh, Dr. Richardson answer as well, but uh, I think it's, uh, I think it would be an important step for us to take. Uh, I want to make sure that we do it in concert with public health and that we uh, do it the right way, but it's uh, currently under discussion. So I expect that uh, before too long, we'll bring something to council for consideration in terms of 
where uh, where maskings will be required and uh, how we're going to how, how we're going to set that out uh, in policy. Uh, Dr. Richardson, if you wanted to add anything to that. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in terms of masks, you know, we've we've been saying for quite some time now that that situational masking is very important. And so we've seen that in transit where we've gone through encouraging people to get masked and then requiring people to get masked. We know in long term care how important it is in other care settings, how important it is. We've really encouraged people where they're unable to maintain that physical separation to be wearing a mask and remembering, of course, that my mask protects you and your mask protects me. And so it's really a, a mutual thing that we're asking for people to do. We have been, you know, following this all along with our public health colleagues from around the province. And certainly we've seen in parts of the province where they still have higher case rates or they have particular situations where it's been important to go forward with that, um, that mandatory mask, masking quickly. And fortunately here in Hamilton, the, the way that our cases are happening, that isn't the primary issue that is driving them um, right now. So we have a bit of time to step back, look at the issue, uh, can, you know, a little further as more evidence comes out that does um, support that this can be helpful and, uh, and make a decision here in Hamilton. So we'll be talking about it more and be uh, working with, uh, with council around it. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Richardson. Next question to Fallon Hewitt from the Hamilton Spectator. Fallon, you can go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. Um, this, is, this goes around mandatory masks. So if uh, they were to become mandatory, how would those be enforced in the city of Hamilton? Uh, I would say we'd use our usual uh, usual bylaw officers that uh, that uh, go around and obviously make the uh, make the enforcement uh, rules around number of people gatherings, uh, you know, locations around Albion Falls when their facilities were closed. Uh, I, I would think that we're going to use the same bylaw folks. Um, having said that, uh, you know, we're looking for compliance if and if and when we do this. Uh, so far, the you know the, the ticketing amounts have been uh, minimal, and uh, most people have been doing what we've been asking them to do, and so uh, that'll be the primary effort. But uh, I imagine there will be some sort of a finding associated with that. But uh, we haven't uh, haven't come to a conclusion on that yet. That's still in the works. And then, uh, why why did you guys call in the province to mandate masks when Hamilton could uh, mandate masks on its own? Well, we got, I think it's more impactful if the the province, who has been making rules and regulations around how we open up, uh, what requirements are, are going to be in place for businesses when they open up, uh, the long list of things that they are required to do before they can actually open the door. Uh, I thought it would have been uh, sensible and reasonable of them to add masking to, to that list. And that would have made it a lot easier for municipalities right across the board because we wouldn't have all individually have had to look at struggling with whether it should or shouldn't or how we do and how we don't get into the masking issue. So uh, we, it would have been much easier had the province taken this on, uh, did, you know, it indicated a, a rule or a regulation that they would require as they've done with so many other things. And that would have simplified the process for every municipality in the province. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Next question to Joey Coleman from the public record. Joey, you can go ahead. For Dr. Richardson, um, I'd like to get in a little bit more into the weeds about masking and about your powers. So there's a certain standard you have to meet to make a Section 22 order under the Health Protection and Promotion Act, but separate from your powers under that act, you advise the Municipal Council on how to use their Section 10 Municipal Act powers. In Toronto, the Medical Officer of Health did not make an order for masking but instead made a recommendation for masking to the council, citing that the medical evidence is not yet at the standard for a section 22, but that it is pointing towards masking as being effective. Could you get a little bit into that decision-making metrics that you have to go through? Sure, absolutely, Joey. And it's it's great that you pick up on those nuances around Section 22 under the Health Protection Promotion Act and the Municipal Act and, and Council's powers to act uh, to protect the health and safety of the, the people in their community. And so there is, um, there is a provision under the HPPA where if there is 
a um, sort of an imminent threat that uh, I can write an order or any medical officer in their jurisdiction can write an order uh, requiring people or individuals or a class of people to take some action or refrain to, from taking some action. And so that is absolutely there and open to us. And we have had some, some situations in Ontario where the medical officers have felt that that test, that this is needed to control the virus in their jurisdictions um, has been met. And, and they have gone ahead and written those orders. Our other job is of course to advise council who has that longer term view in terms of, of protecting the health and safety of our residents as to what from a policy perspective do they feel is reasonable um, in order to protect health and safety. And so it is a longer term view. There is more room for that values-based decision-making which is very important in the democratic process. And so in those settings, that's my role to give them the best advice I can in terms of what um, is open to them. And uh, of course, that also comes with advice from our legal department and many others who would be involved. And so uh, that's the situation we're in here because the epidemiology right now for COVID-19 in Hamilton does not point to this being something that needs to be done imminently. It's something that we can weigh and consider and council can make a decision on. In one of your answers to a previous media question, Dr. Richardson, you had discussed some of the trends in terms of the spread of COVID within Hamilton. You noted that you did not need to look at mandatory masking because at this point, um, you it has not reached there in terms of some of the spread. Uh, I noticed that the demographics, the age demographics have sort of balanced out across the various segments that are reported in the past 10 days. The number of cases amongst age 20 to 29 has significantly dropped. There's been an increase in 30 to 39. Because the numbers are small, it's not necessarily significant. One or two cases can change that percentage. Could you give us some sense of what trends you're watching for right now and what you may be seeing? Muted. There we go. Now I can actually, you can hear me, right, Joey? Um, it's very interesting with the work our epidemiologists do and to take the data and um, look at what we can understand from it. And yes, you're right. From an age perspective, we are seeing a bit more balancing across the age groups. We still see transmission in family clusters, that close, longer um, contact really being important in the spread of this disease. And that could be a family, that could be roommates. Um, that's certainly the biggest piece that we continue to see. And that's why it is, you know, that those areas where it's so important if somebody becomes sick to try and do distancing, but we know how hard it is. And that's where we're seeing some of that leveling out too. We've seen an increase in our younger cases um, because they're part of those households and are getting sick as a result of that. Um, so we're watching all of those trends. We want to, of course, continue to watch and see what happens in our institutions, in our congregate settings, where we have people who are at particular risk um, due to age or because of other social determinants of health. So we're looking at those as well. And we're very much looking forward to um, as well, look at the, the, de the socio-demographics that go along with this. So you know that we began to collect the information on income and on race, those sorts of issues. And we're looking to prepare a report probably coming forward in September. We think we'll have enough numbers to, uh, to do the analysis and, and look at some meaningful trends because we know we've seen across uh, North America and elsewhere the, um, the concentration of cases in those lower income, uh, more marginalized populations. And so we want to, uh, to look and see what those trends are like here in Hamilton as well. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Next question will be to Lisa Poleski from CHML. Lisa, you can go ahead. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, my uh, concern is mainly about the enforcement of the, uh, if, if the city did decide to go ahead with uh, making masks mandatory, um, the enforcement seems to be kind of a tricky piece because as uh, Paul Johnson mentioned last week in terms of masks on the HSR, it's, you can't really um, tell necessarily by looking at someone whether or not they have a medical condition that prevents them from being able to wear a mask. So how would that be handled if the city did decide to go with uh, mandatory masks? 
So I can I can start on this one um, since you referenced my answer from from last week. I mean, our whole approach approach to enforcement has been about education and would continue to be. And I think in communities that have moved forward with masking, that's what you're seeing. That this is about an education campaign. This is about indicating to the community just how seriously they are taking the issue of of wearing of uh, non medical masks. And when we did it with the transit system here in Hamilton, it was the same thing. Uh, this is not about going around and, and barring people from entering a bus. Uh, this is not about having um, uh, someone from bylaw and, on buses regularly, uh, you know, monitoring people. Uh, this is about a way that we can, however, have some tools at our disposal should, there, should it reach a level that uh, would require some, some enforcement. Uh, we don't have enough officers, we don't have enough hours in the day, we don't have enough eyes on that we could do this type of work across the city the same way we couldn't with physical distancing. And I think if we reflect on our physical distancing work, which came into effect, I think around April 9th, uh, very few tickets actually issued. But what it did was it allowed our bylaw officers who, who would uh, experience something, would observe something, to engage in a conversation um, and legitimately be able to engage in that conversation. And I think that's very much in keeping with what we want to see. Uh, this is uh, very much about indicating the importance of it if it is to, to happen in Hamilton, and certainly looking at the uh, the things that are coming forward in other communities. That's what this is about. It's also uh, about encouraging the places uh, the businesses and the environments, the indoor environments, to take this very seriously as well. Uh, we need the cooperation of the folks that own the space where people are going to be indoors, as well as we need the people uh, who are visiting these spaces to take this seriously. And I think that that allows us to do uh, to do both things, and that uh, is where it would head. But in terms of hiring of more people, no, uh, we didn't do that under physical distancing. I can't imagine we would uh, contemplate that as staff uh, to bring forward as a as a suggestion to council. It would be as the mayor suggesting, using the same people. Um, if we had to address something or investigate something, we might do that. But this is very much about education and very much a, a, a movement in sort of the GTHA to say this is a really important piece um, in, in order to stop the spread at this particular moment. And particularly as we start to open more facilities and see people engage in more activities in our community. Not something we needed quite as dramatically in stage one when everybody was really encouraged just to be at home and stay close to home. But certainly as we move into stage two and, and potentially into stage three in the next few weeks, um, this could be a, a helpful tool. And that will be the conversation we want to start with council in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. No follow-up questions at this point. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Paul. Next question to Katrina Clark from the Hamilton Spectator. So Katrina can go ahead. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Richardson. Uh, I'm a bit confused with the the issues with the taking too long for people to get their test results back. I'm wondering if this is a new issue that public health is seeing, and I'm confused about whether or not the delays are due to a lack of resources on the public health side, or if it's an issue with the labs. So just uh, in terms of the, the test, just to, to remember, the testing is done either through an assessment center or through some other you know, care provider that is providing testing. We don't actually do any of the testing, nor do we run the tests in terms of, of getting them done. All we do right now is for the assessment centers, we are doing the booking in to schedule people for their tests. And we are also, for those who are positive in terms of their tests, we are calling to follow up and, and do the case and contact management that is really important in ensuring the control of the, of the disease. We are getting a lot of phone calls related to people wanting to book into testing because of some of the requirements from a policy perspective um, for getting tests done, particularly for long-term care homes and retirement homes. Those are um, where a lot of the pressure is coming from in terms of doing tests. But once the test is done and, and the results are being conveyed to people, we don't have a role in that piece. That all happens uh, now as the province put together that they go to a central portal and that is where people can go to get their results. So if they aren't getting their result, results through that route, they can either go back to the person who did the test for them and see if they've gotten the test back already, or they can go to their family doctor who does have access to um, some of the systems that are that are out there that they could look up that, uh, that particular test result. So 
when it comes to getting results, the, the issues are not um, related to public health and we can't really speak to the, the issues that the province may be having, the provincial lab may be having in transferring results onto the, the lab website, the OLIS website. Um, so I'm trying to remember Katrina in terms of, did you have other pieces of the question for us? For me? Yeah, I'm just wondering if this is a new issue, like is public health hearing from more people who are concerned about delays in getting results? It ebbs and flows. Um, it's ebbed and flowed over time in terms of how fast the turnaround time has been on results. We're only able to track the turnaround time on positive results. And we know that there, the system does prioritize those because there is something that needs to be done quickly in order for control measures to be put in place. And so we know for, um, as of now, about 60%, as I said, are coming back within 24 hours. At the end of May, we were up at closer to 80% of them were coming back within 24 hours. So that has dropped back a little bit. In terms of the timeline for the negative results, it does seem to be longer, but we're not sure if part of that is that we're hearing more from people um, than we did previously because they are, are needing them so much now for going into long-term care homes and retirement homes to do visiting. So we may be hearing more related to that than we had before. Okay, do, and if I still have a follow-up there, um, I'm wondering, can you speak to why positive results come back sooner? So essentially, um, the for the positive results, we're getting them quite quickly and we know that when there's somebody who is symptomatic or there's an outbreak that is going on, that they, those are being prioritized so that the control measures can be put in place quite quickly um, in terms of contact tracing and all of those sorts of things and outbreak being declared, um, any of those things. So there are real, really important actions that need to take place. Now we, that by no means discounts the fact that as the mayor said earlier for an individual and the people who are around them to hear about a negative result is, uh, is important as well. But um, when resources are you know being managed I, they are prioritizing those positive results um, from what we're seeing thank you thanks dr richardson next question to joanna from the hamilton spectator joanna you can go ahead hi thanks so much for taking my question um, i'd like to go back to mass uh, and uh, see do you have any sense of um, how much people like are people wearing masks like do you have any idea of what compliance is right now so perhaps I'll take that one. At this point, we're not doing surveys um, around mask wearing. Our, our evidence is anecdotal by and large. I know in Ottawa, where they have been doing surveys, they are seeing about 70% of people are actually wearing surveys, wearing masks in the settings where they would be recommended. Um, that is, uh, you know, Paul's also had the, the information around transit in particular. Um, but we don't uh, have any specific information from Hamilton that's, that's based on good survey information or that sort of thing that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. And last week, I specifically asked if Hamilton was considering um, making masks mandatory after the province first floated the idea of public health departments doing it on its own. And I was told that that was not something that was being considered because the uptake here was good. So what has sort of changed uh, to make both uh, you, know, you and the mayor now uh, be looking for mandatory mask wearing? So perhaps, Mr. Mayor, I can start that one. Um, so in terms of us looking at it, as I said earlier, the, our epidemiology right now, so the, the patterns of the disease that's happening here in Hamilton, we're not seeing that people not wearing masks is a big part of what's uh, contributing to transmission. So we are not seeing, for example, what we are seeing, I should say, for example, is that we're seeing it still in those clusters that are either family or household related, and not so much the, uh, the straight community acquired uh, cases or specific situations or outbreaks where people should be wearing them has happened in Kingston um, and uh, and they've led to large outbreaks that uh, and large numbers of people that need to be followed up. So we've had as well not the same number of cases that Toronto or Peel and the kind of density that they have in terms of their cases that is also causing them to to be uh, to want to move that forward more quickly. But we've certainly also been watching the science on this. And while it's still not definitive about whether masks um, would be um, 
something that will definitely change things. There is, there's been another study or two that have come out that say, you know, when we, when we have mask wearing as something that's mandatory, as Paul said earlier, it's a signal to the community that it's serious, that it's still going on, that they need to take these measures as well as all the other public health measures. And that's the important thing to remember is it's just one component of this. All the others are still very important. Um, but it's a signal that um, this is something that we need to continue to do. And what they've seen as well in follow-up is that the level of mask wearing tends to go up when those kinds of policies are in place. So that's the primary drivers behind us looking at it. It's something like everything, we're always looking at it and what information comes forward and what we know about that is new. And um, as things change, we do change our approach based on what we know. I, I could add that uh, that you know there's a fair bit of public pressure as well in the business community. I think they're uh, they're asking uh, you know the awkward uh, question when people come into the store. They're asking them to do a lot of things: uh, physically separate, stand outside, and wait until you know a certain amount of people have been uh, allowed into the store. And uh, this is just one more question they don't want to have to ask. Uh, you know, an additional masking question. So you know, how, how can we help them uh, as things start to open up? To, uh, to have their uh, employees and their customers feel a little safer. And I think masking will do that. Uh, so, uh, you know, not only has, has there been, you know, increased public demand, I've also heard the other side in terms of the civil liberties issues. So clearly, uh, you know, some have come forward and said, if you do this, uh, we're gonna challenge it. Uh, we think it's a civil liberties or freedom, freedom of bill, rights and freedoms issue. Um, you know, I, I think we're way past that uh, in many respects in terms of what uh, COVID has done to require us to take certain steps to protect the public. But, uh, you know, there are multiple voices out there, but I think a lot of voices right now are saying, uh, you know, it largely because, it, as well as because other communities are also getting that kind of community public pressure, that, uh, that public pressure is certainly being applied here as well. And certainly that's a factor, not the only decision, but certainly a factor. And, and my view has always been that we'll follow public health uh, recommendations. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the way that the, the, the good doctor has described it, I think is, is fairly accurate as things become more open. I think the need for masking becomes more acute. And uh, I think for, uh, for all the right reasons, uh, it's, it's a kind of a dual protection for both uh, the person using it, uh, um, the wearer and, and anyone else that they come into contact with. So it's, it has demonstrated to be very, very effective. Great, thanks everyone for your questions. With that, Mr. Mayor, that's the end of our media questions for today. So I'll pass things back to you for some closing remarks. Thank you very much. And thank you all for, uh, for dialing in today and, uh, and happy Canada Day. Looking forward to a great day tomorrow. But before we do that, I wanna thank Bill Custers and the Cable 14 team for continuing to help us put this broadcast together and McLean Media that ensures that this uh, goes smoothly. And uh, tomorrow, Canada Day is a great day to celebrate uh, the wonderful, diverse, brilliant Canada that uh, I, in my view is the envy of the world. And uh, we can do that. And what we'd like to have been able to do was to go to Bayfront Park and have that great concert and fire off those fireworks with everyone uh, gathered around. Unfortunately, we can't do that this year, but we can do and have done and, and have organized a one hour Canada Day airing of a special on CHCH TV starting at seven o'clock tomorrow, uh, produced by Sonic Onion. Uh, and it will feature uh, performances from Tara Lightfoot, Tom Wilson, the Hamilton Children's Choir, and the Hamilton Philharmonic uh, Brass Quintet, uh, as well as uh, tomorrow there will be, so that'll be a great show, and that'll be an hour before the eight o'clock uh, national broadcast for Canada Today, virtual as well. And then additionally, the Canada Warplane Heritage Museum will also be doing a Canada Day flyover, weather permitting, and by all accounts, the weather looks like it's going to be fantastic. So uh, look for the uh, Warplane uh, flyovers uh, throughout the city uh, tomorrow as well. And uh, we hope that everyone has a spectacular day with family, with friends, those of you, those in your social bubble that can get together and uh, enjoy the day do the barbecue uh, within your social circle, uh, obviously maintaining physical distancing and all the other rules and regulations that we have in place, but uh, still an opportunity to, to enjoy your city and, and, and celebrate this great country of ours, Canada. So on behalf of all of us here, happy Canada Day, and we'll see you uh, Thursday. Bye -bye.